It's five o'clock sharp Swiss time, and it's my pleasure to welcome all of you to today's talk in ISI's Game Changer series. I am Joachim Wamsgans, Director for Astrophysics and Cosmology at ISI and your host today. This year, ISI, the International Space Science Institute in Bern, Switzerland, celebrates its 25th anniversary. For a quarter of a century, ISI has served the space science community by offering various tools for scientists to meet in Bern and jointly do science related to space missions. Currently, physical meetings in Bern are not possible, so we try to create a couple of new ways for scientists to collaborate, interact, and exchange information. The ISI Game Changer series is one of these new tools where we look at missions that change the game in the space sciences. We started in late July and have had about a dozen talks on missions to planets, dwarf planets, comets, and the sun itself, like Cassini, Rosetta, Ulysses, or Juno. Four weeks ago, the talks on astrophysics and cosmology missions started with a seminar on Integral, followed by talks on the Gaia mission and on the Hubble Space Telescope. Last week, we heard a talk on the Planck satellite. And uh, in case you missed any of our previous talks, they were recorded and can be viewed on the ESI website. Before I introduce today's speaker, let me announce next week's talk. Arvind Palmer from ESA at Nordwijk, the Netherlands, will talk about the mission XMM Newton, New Visions of the X-ray Universe. Magali de Jeu is a senior scientist at the Laboratoire Astrophysique de Marseille and a professor at Aix Marseille University. She has been head of the exoplanet team at LAM and co-head of the planetary system group at LAM. After this is on spectroscopic analysis of subdwarfs, Magali carried out various studies on circumstellar disks around young stars and debris disks. In 1996, she enlarged her scientific interest to detection characterization of exoplanets by the transit and radial velocity methods. Magali Deleu was and is involved in the preparation and exploitation of various space-based exoplanet missions. She has led the International Corot Exoplanet Collaboration and is the coordinator of the French participation in PLATO. She's a member of the PLATO Science Working Team appointed by ESA and of the board and involved and of the board of PLATO board and involved in both the PLATO Data Processing Center and the PLATO Scientific Exploration. Magali de is also very engaged in teaching, covering topics ranging from mathematics, computer science, physics, to astronomy and astrophysics. She has also developed a MOOC, a massive open online course. Today, we're looking forward to your talk on CORO, the first transiting exoplanets from space. Magali, the stage is yours. Thank you very much, Joachim, for this uh, very nice introduction. And thank you a lot to the EASY Seminar Organizing Committee for inviting me to give this talk. It's a real pleasure to have the opportunity to, uh, to give this overview of the results we achieved with the Coro Space Mission, in fact. And um, also, I'm going to put things a bit into context uh, with my few first slides. Um, and getting back to the old time where, in, in fact, uh, the first planets were discovered, the first exoplanet were discovered, but also the first transiting planet was discovered. So it's a uh, HT209458. Uh, 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 and we had these two um, historical papers uh, with the first transits observed from the ground and from space. And uh, at the time, uh, Koro uh, started his, uh, its observation in 2006. In fact, uh, the situation in terms of uh, transiting planets uh, as a function of the orbital period was uh, the, what is uh, uh, shown on the slide. And um, so the transit depth is, uh, of course, proportional to the, or gives the planet size. And most of the detected planets were the size of Jupiter or uh, even a bit uh, larger. And, Indeed. So Corot has provided us with the new planets 
and uh, also candidates. We, we're going to talk about that a bit uh, later. So we, we detect the instrument allow us to detect 600 candidates, among which we, we had, uh, in fact, uh, I think it's, it's not up to date, uh, 35 uh, planets and round dwarf fully characterized, uh, which mean uh, with mass constraint greater than three sigma. Okay, so we, we were able to, to, to reach more or less the, the domain of uh, Neptune-sized planets. Indeed, afterward, uh, after uh, Koro, Kepler came and changed completely the game and populate this uh, uh, diagram with uh, thousands of planet candidates and, and, and uh, thousands of planets, in fact. Okay, so... Um, to, to give a bit of context uh, again, uh, the, uh, I, I like this kind of uh, histogram, which gives uh, the number of planets uh, discovered per year. And uh, you see here the, the key dates with the uh, first uh, discovery of 51 Peg B, and we are proud to, to, uh, to have uh, Michel Mayor and uh, Didier Kelo. Uh, 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 um, the, the English, uh, it doesn't matter. They got the, the Nobel Prize and we are very proud of that because they changed completely. They opened a new field of research, in fact. So Koro um, was launched in 2006 and one year later, uh, Kepler was launched. And, and in fact, what you can see when you compare the, 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 the number of planets which have been discovered through transit uh, and uh, in total, is that the transit uh, planets are now very numerous. They account for about three uh, uh, quarter of all the discoveries. And, but what is more interesting is that with the transit method, you can measure the radius of the planet. And that is key for the science you can do afterward with. Okay, so uh, now moving, moving to Coro, in fact, so it was a French, European, Brazilian mission. It was led by the, the CNES, the, the French uh, Space Agency, in fact. It had uh, a scientific program, which was a double. One uh, was a study of a stellar structure by asteroid seismology, the detection of uh, stellar vibration, in fact. And the second one was the planet search through the transit method. And of course, all the data acquired to, to, uh, um, to match these the two uh, scientific programs were uh, also benefited the, the stellar physics um, uh, field, in fact. So the instrument started its operation in January 2007. And uh, it, it was uh, uh, in operation till uh, October 2012, where we had a, a breakdown of the one of the of, of, uh, of the DPU. In fact, we we, we lost uh, the DPU due to uh, an electronic problem, uh, which was more or less identified, but we could not fix. In fact. So the instrument was set up on a polar orbit. The exoplanet field of view was uh, nearly three um, degrees. And half after two, uh, 2009, because we lost one of the two DPU at that time. And uh, okay, and so the uh, photometric precision was uh, uh, 700 ppm per hour. And uh, we, uh, the instrument allow us to collect uh, nearly uh, a bit about 170,000 of light curves. With the time sampling in the exoplanet channel uh, of 32 seconds, and sometimes we, we um, go added uh, individual exposure up to uh, 512 seconds, in fact, some uh, time sampling. Okay, so here you have an overview of the satellites. So the, um, uh, with the uh, payload, which is here, it was uh, a kind of, uh, well, 
a pretty big instrument, in fact, uh, well, but we have a, a, a more bigger instrument. 300 kilo, uh, it was made of a single telescope uh, of 27 centimeter of axis telescope. And uh, it was topped by a, a pretty long baffle in order to protect the, the, um, the instrument from, uh, from, from uh, uh, Parasitic, uh, well, uh, from, from additional light, in fact. Okay, so uh, then moving to the focal plane. In fact, the focal plane was paved with four CCD, as uh, you can see on this uh, little uh, schema. In fact, two of the CCD were dedicated to the Aceroseismology program, and two other ones were dedicated to the exoplanet uh, program, in fact. And what you can see on this um, a cut of the focal plane. Uh, in fact, the, the two channels could not be exchanged because in front of the exoplanet CCD, we put a biprism, uh, which uh, provide us uh, uh, with a small PSF, which were in fact a small uh, a spectra, spectra with a uh, dispersion of about uh, of about four, uh, not not a lot, uh, not a lot, uh, uh, very small dispersion, but uh, in fact uh, enough to uh, uh, provide us with um, uh, how would I say um, a special information also on the CCD. In fact, so the instrument was. Uh, uh, thermal uh, stabilized uh, very well, in fact, uh, and uh, the temperature was minus uh, 40 degrees Celsius. So what uh, here you have a view of the kind of uh, field of view of the, of the sky as uh, uh, Koro uh, saw, in fact. So here the uh, exoplanet uh, CCD and here the asteroseismology uh, channel. And you can see why we called uh, the one faint channel and the other one bright channel, in fact. So they were not at all, uh, as you, uh, I didn't mention that, they are, were not uh, at all aligned uh, at the same position in the focal plane. The, um, Asteroseismology was slightly defocused, while the exoplanet channel wa uh, was focused, but with the prism in front of the CCD. So, um, so the asteroseismology uh, was sensitive to bright stars, and so it was uh, able to observe uh, about uh, a tenth of bright stars uh, at the same time, plus. 10 uh, background windows. And in the exoplanet fields, because the transit method is, um, has a low uh, probability, in, in fact, we, were, we had to observe a lot of stars in order to increase the chance of detecting transits. And so we, we target faint stars in the range 11 to 16 in order to achieve a high number of uh, targets. And we observe that way more than uh, um, 10,000 uh, targets at the same time with the 400 background windows, in fact. And what you can see, uh, because the, 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 the image is not, enough zoom is that in fact the PSF in the exoplanet channel were not round at all, but were uh, elongated because of the prism. So here you have a uh, zoom on the exoplanet CCD. What we did also, so the photometric was performed uh, on board, in fact, with predefined photometric mask, which uh, we, we had uh, um, 256 uh, photometric tam uh, templates available on board that were allocated, uh, uh, automatically allocated in order to optimize the target signal to noise. And in addition, what we did is that uh, we, we cut the um, photometric mask in three different uh, area. And because of the, of the prism, in fact, one the corresponded 
to the red part of the uh, PSF, here the green, and uh, the, the last one, what the blue part of the PSF. So for the brightest uh, targets, we had not only uh, one light curve in white, uh, in white uh, color, but also three additional color light curves in red, in green, and in blue. And it, it's uh, what is uh, plotted here. It's, that's our uh, Coro observed, uh, one Coro observed light curve. You have the white light curve here and the, the photometry uh, done in the red channel the green channel and the blue channel. And in that case, it is interesting because what you can see here is that all the information which is contained in the white light curve comes in fact from the blue channel, the, the, the blue part of the PSF. And it indicates it's a, a case where in fact the um, this signal in the blue channel is not due to the target itself, but it's due to a contaminant, a nearby contaminant, which uh, might be uh, an eclipsing binary, in fact. So something to, uh, so we end up with uh, about, for, for single uh, pointing, uh, 9,000 uh, targets brighter than magnitude 15, for which we got in addition to this, the, the white light curve, three color light curves. And uh, something to keep in mind is that we, we had no direct correspondence to any standard photometric band for, for these colors, in fact. But they were very useful to allow us to, to identify uh, all these uh, false positives, in fact. So I, I want to, under, to underline uh, that uh, Coro has been a very, uh, um, fantastic collaborative uh, team. In fact, we had a lot of young people. We were we we organized a regular meeting. We set up uh, teleconference, regular teleconferences, uh, and so on. And and so we we, we had um, many yearly uh, sessions in order to work together, and that trigger uh, a new generation also of young scientists. And uh, we have also good uh, team building sessions uh, uh, all together. And uh, that was a great time. OK, so coming back to science. Uh, so the observations, so the instrument, I forgot to, to, to put uh, a schema showing um, the, the polar orbit of, uh, of the instrument. But in order not to be blinded by, by the sun, twice a year, we had to rotate the instrument and point it in the opposite direction. And uh, so, in fact, the instrument was able to stare at the same field for six months before being rotated and uh, pointed to uh, the opposite direction in, um, okay. So uh, that way we observed 26 exoplanet fields uh, located in two continuous viewing zones, which are uh, drawn here. Uh, um, anti-center and center field uh, direction. So the run duration was pretty flexible and uh, we had the, the, the possibility to, to, to observe up to six months, but mo most of the time the, um, what we did is to observe a given field for about 20, 25 days, and then another field for uh, up to 152 uh, days, in, in fact. And these observations were done with a high duty cycle uh, greater than 90%. Uh, so you have here uh, on these uh, two plots, the um, imprints of the Coro CCD, uh, beginning of the mission, the two exoplanet CCD, and then we lost one uh, first uh, DPU chain and so we end up with just a single uh, CCD for the exoplanet uh, channel. And uh, you have here the location of the various field in the anti center and the uh, center, uh, galaxy center direction, in fact. And what you can see is that this observ uh, observing strategy was very flexible, and we had the possibility to reobserve the same field sometimes either entirely, like uh, here, for example, sometimes we, we just had a portion of the field uh, which was observed uh, two times or three times. 
So uh, we we do uh, we did a lot of work in order to characterize uh, the stellar population. Uh, some um, you have here the um, so it was done mostly uh, on um, photometric observation, ground based photometric observations, so color separation, so not very accurate, but it allows us to 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 get. Well, a, a good overview of the stellar content of uh, our fields, and you have here the, the histogram distribution over the various um, spectral type of the target in the center and anti-center fields. Okay, so in total, we observed uh, 163 and something uh, thousand of targets. Uh, among them, uh, 12,000 were observed two times, and uh, nearly 1,000 were observed three times. So at different epochs, and among all the, these uh, targets, uh, we had uh, uh, more than 100,000 uh, uh, which were classified uh, dwarfs. And uh, if we focus on the best target for, for transit detection, uh, we have about uh, uh, 50,000 uh, uh, F, G, K, and M dwarfs in, in the exoplanet fields. Okay, and you have here histograms uh, of the magnitude of the target, and you can see that uh, where we were mostly, uh, do, we were indeed dominated by, by a high magnitude uh, stars, which was also uh, afterward an issue for the follow-up observations. So uh, LR uh, stands for long run, A for anti-center, C for center, SR short run, anti-center and center. Okay, so for uh, detection performances, you have here some uh, uh, plots which shows the transit signal as a function of the orbital period. For, uh, I think uh, I put there uh, the eclipsing binaries and uh, the uh, uh, planet candidates and planets. Uh, so just to, to get a, a feeling of the uh, the, the kind of uh, detection performances we had with uh, Kuro. And in fact, what you can see is that we were mostly sensitive to um, uh, short uh, period at uh, planet at short, short orbital period. And in fact, the sensitivity uh, increase when we, we go uh, to, to fields that, that were observed for more than just uh, a couple of tens day, in fact. For the, the fields, we were able to, to, um, to observe for more than 100 days when then we, we went through the, in the domain of uh, small size planets, Neptune size planets uh, mostly. But you have here uh, Coro 7, uh, which uh, was the first super Earth transiting super Earth, I will um, talk about it uh, later on, in fact. Uh, I have to pay attention to the time. So in terms of detection domain, also what is interesting is to just to see the distribution of the depth for both, again, the candidates and the, the um, eclipsing binaries. And uh, so uh, we, we can see how they, they distribute the, the, the two, in fact, uh, uh, with the eclipsing binary in pink, uh, which goes to, uh, up to, to uh, high depth in, in, uh, indeed. And for orbital period, here again, it's another way to illustrate the fact that the mission was very sensitive to uh, planets uh, at short orbital period, in fact. So, but we had some, some detection at uh, much longer orbital period, less than 100 days in any case. So the, 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 the long uh, baseline is key for, for this kind of mission, in fact, definitely. Okay, so starting from uh, the, the detection, I will not uh, talk about the detection. I will try to, to, to focus on the science and so on. But before, what I want to emphasize is whatever the method you have with the transit uh, method, 
once you have detected your transit events, it doesn't guarantee you 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 are you have detected a planet, because you have number of uh, uh, false positive situation starting with the regular eclipsing binaries, but even in the eclipsing binaries you can have some some tricks, and going to uh, what we call diluted eclipsing binary, you have your target here, and in fact the eclipsing binary is. Uh, um, close to your line of sight, it could, be, it could be associated with your target as a triple system, but it could be just um, uh, a faint, uh, a much, um, an eclipsing binary, which is uh, uh, at uh, a longer distance, but close to the uh, uh, line of sight of your, of your target. And so the, the signal of your, dilute, uh, of your eclipsing binary is dil, uh, diluting your, the signal of your uh, target indeed. And in order to identify these uh, false positives, we set up a large um, follow-up uh, campaign using number of facilities uh, at uh, every uh, at different location uh, of the planet and um, different techniques, which are here illustrated on this slide. We use on-off photometry in, in order to uh, uh, validate the fact that, or, or verify whether the signal, uh, transiting signal was due to the target or to a nearby contaminant. Okay, with the with the better contrast images than the, the one uh, we uh, we had uh, on the Coros CD, of course, we use also high contrast imaging in order to to uh, narrow the the, the distance uh, where we could uh, try to find contaminants. Uh, we used uh, also radial velocity measurements to identify a uh, false positive. Here you have, uh, uh, I think, a CCF with uh, uh, three peaks, which shows that you have uh, uh, your, your transit signal is due, in fact, to a, a triple system. And of course, we, we had also, um, uh, we, we carry out a lot of spectroscopic analysis of the host stars in order to derive the host, uh, stellar, uh, the host uh, fundamental parameters, the stellar radius, mass, of course, and age, uh, which are mandatory, whatever your detection method, in order to, to, get, to derive the corresponding planet uh, parameter. Okay, so in terms of uh, follow-up completeness, uh, here you can see uh, the, um, the number of uh, uh, candidates, the percentage of candidates we were able to, uh, to follow thanks to a complementary observation or to, to observe from the ground um, in order to, to assess or secure the nature of the planet uh, candidate uh, uh, co-detected. And you can see that uh, for, for most of them, the brightest one, we, we were able to, to, to carry out uh, follow-up uh, follow observations. But indeed, we were in trouble for the faintest uh, one for which, uh, in fact, ground-based facilities uh, are not sensitive enough, in fact. And so we, we end up with uh, some uh, candidates for which we were not able to, to, uh, to get complementary uh, uh, information, in fact and whose status is, is still, in fact, uh, open, in fact. So we have uh, one of the nearly 200 uh, good candidates uh, whose status uh, remain uh, yet uh, are still uh, unresolved, and uh, among which, based to the, the outcome of uh, both the detection and the follow-up observation, uh, we, we, uh, we uh, estimated that uh, eight plus minus three planets are still to be confirmed. But the issue, as you can see on this plot, is, uh, is, coming, is due to the, the, the magnitude of the, of the host. Um, you, on this sketch, what you can do, uh, I said that, that from the detection to the 
well secured and characterized planets the 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 it's it's a long uh, uh, it's a long way and uh, in fact in total from the 4000 and something detection uh, we were able to identify the false alarms um, again uh, false alarms due to instrumental um, issues in fact what we call ghost signals uh, we had uh, 100 uh, 1060 something uh, detached uh, eclipsing binary uh, a few hundred of contact binaries, uh, false positive due to stellar variations and, and, and stuff like that. And uh, okay, and here uh, 594 transit candidates, among which um, some were monotransits, others were multi transit candidates. Uh, the proportion we, we uh, followed with um, ground-based programs and out of which we were able again to filter out uh, false positives like uh, contaminating eclipsing binaries. Uh, I don't remember what this acronym means, but uh, eclipsing binaries. And we end up with some um, cases for uh, unclosed cases uh, we don't know the the exact nature in fact of the transiting body and we we have uh, uh, 37 planets or brown dwarf clearly uh, secured through all this uh, schema or the uh, data, data flow and uh, yes okay so from these results we were able to derive uh, giant planet occurrences that's the the best estimate because in fact uh, uh, most of the detection were in the uh, giant planet domain uh, what is interesting is uh, you have here an overview of the occurrence for giant planet uh, derived uh, through radial velocity measurement by kepler by TESS, uh, maybe a bit uh, what it was uh, one year ago, uh, maybe some, some re more recent publication, I don't know, but at least. And, and so, Koro, so what is um, striking is that uh, our uh, giant occurrence is more in agreement with the result from radial velocities program than uh, from Kepler. Uh, that's something to be uh, better understood, whether it is due to different region uh, pointed out by, uh, uh, by Koro uh, and Kepler uh, uh, of the galaxy. Uh, I, well, I don't know. We, we don't have any uh, clear answer today, in fact. Uh, and then uh, for um, planets in, uh, let's say, uh, more temperate uh, more, more planet, giant planet uh, at uh, lo much longer orbital period, less than 85 days. Uh, our estimate is uh, more in agreement with uh, the one derived from, uh, from Kepler here and there, in fact. Okay. So some uh, highlights uh, of the planets we found, they are overplotted in red on this uh, mass uh, radius uh, di diagram. Most of them are in the domain of uh, giant planets. We have a few in the domain mostly of uh, Neptune-like planets. And uh, um, here in comparison with the... Um, well, okay, let's forget about uh, this uh, diagram. This one is, is uh, more interesting. So what is interesting here is the diversity. We, we, uh, with Kepler, we have discovered the diversity in the domain uh, of small size planets. But with, uh, even with Koro and ground-based uh, observation, what we see is the diversity of giant planets. And, uh, uh, but by combining mass and radius measurements, it gives you the density of the planet, and we were able to assess the planet internal structure. And we did this kind of analysis for most of the, the coral planet, and uh, confronting these uh, uh, mass radius, uh, planet mass radius estimate with the age 
of the, uh, the planetary systems derived from the age of the host stars, we were able to uh, estimate uh, or, or get some insight into the composition of the planet. And you have here two examples. One is Koro 8. It's, uh, it's um, a kind of regular uh, uh, giant planet with a high metal content and uh, uh, an envelope of uh, helium and uh, hydrogen. Okay, and um, uh, here you have Coro 20B, uh, which is more at odd because uh, um, according to the uh, modeling of the planet, in fact, uh, to, to reproduce the, the, the density of the planet and uh, the age of the system, we end up with a, a core mass, which is in between 700 and 1000 uh, Earth masses, and something which is at odd with uh, the um, uh, planet formation models, but which points toward maybe different formation paths. In fact, for this uh, giant planet, uh, uh, for this giant planet, or maybe just uh, different evolutionary paths. Uh, another key parameters, which uh, is the eccentricity of your um, of your planet, with the giant planet, and thanks to the radial velocity measurements, we were able to to. Uh, to measure the eccentricity of uh, our transiting planets. And uh, uh, in fact, uh, wh what is interesting here is that uh, it, uh, in, in principle, because of the short orbital period, you will expect the planet to be circularized, in fact. You have massive planet at short orbital period. So uh, such a high eccentricity is something which is at none really expected, in fact. But knowing the eccentricity, the mass of the planet, and the um, orbital distance, you can also get some insights into the um, uh, tidal quality factor for the planet, the QP parameter, which indicates uh, how uh, your, your, your planet responds to the uh, uh, tidal dissipation, in fact. And by confronting the, the, um, uh, the um, you, you can um, uh, confronting the, the, the uh, current estimate of the uh, uh, eccentricity, you can uh, go back in time and uh, check uh, what could be the, the um, tidal quality factor of the planet to achieve the, the, the kind of eccentricity and orbital parameter we, uh, we, are, uh, we see today, in fact. And in the case of uh, Koro, which one number was it? Uh, I have forgotten uh, the, the number of the planet, but uh, in the case of this planet, we were able to, to uh, <laughs> Um, to, um, uh, to constrain the, the, the quality uh, factor, uh, uh, and, and then we, we, we derive that uh, the quality factor should be more than uh, uh, a few uh, 10 to 5 uh, because of uh, the, the current situation of the planet, the current parameters of the planet. Okay, uh, we had some uh, good successes with the discovery of uh, Corona B, uh, a temperate uh, giant with an orbital period uh, uh, of uh, 95 days. Uh, it was the first temperate uh, gi transiting giant planet. Uh, so it's, it's a, a clear uh, Jupiter-like uh, planet. Okay, with the, uh, an eccentricity which is uh, uh, very uh, low, and, and, and it was interesting because it was the first time we were able to get a radius measurement of this kind of planet, which was uh, the kind of planets the radial velocity uh, surveys were able 
to, uh, to detect and measure and get an estimate of the mass. So it, it was uh, 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 an interesting first uh, because uh, it appears as a, a kind of a reference to better understand the nature of uh, these planets. Among the surprises we, we had uh, are the brown dwarfs, transiting brown dwarfs. And they, they are very rare at short orbital period, the, the so-called uh, brown dwarf desert and desert. And uh, the first one was Coro uh, 3b. At the time, we had uh, the, the label Exo 3b. Uh, we let it down afterward. Uh, and uh, it was interesting because uh, uh, it was an orbital period uh, of a few days and well in the radius mass diagram in the middle between the planets and the very small stars. And afterward, we were able to, to detect a couple of them again, Coro 15b, Coro 33b. And it was int very interesting because we could compare the um, radius measurements to the theoretical models and, uh, and check how well they, they, uh, they match or not. And uh, we were also able to derive uh, an occurrence rate for this kind of uh, uh, peculiar population, in fact. Uh, yes, hello. So, so I wanted to say a few words about activity. Activity uh, is uh, sometimes uh, uh, seen as uh, an issue for the detection. So for this kind of, um, for transiting planet, and uh, as long as you don't go to uh, a very long period planets, uh, in activity is not really an issue for the detection, but it is an issue for the estimate of your real uh, radius, because the, the, the activity change the depth uh, affect the depth of your transits. And so the trick is to be able to, to reconstruct the, the, uh, the, the real depth uh, due to your transiting planet. Uh, and so what is the, its real uh, radius also. And um, so Coro 2b that uh, you, you can see the light curve here, it was absolutely fantastic. You have all the uh, stellar uh, activity which uh, module the, uh, uh, the Coro light curve. And uh, you can see that uh, from one transit to another one, the depth of the transit can change a lot, in fact. Uh, so it can, uh, reduce, uh, as a conclusion, your, your, your transit can be uh, affected by, by, uh, by a few percent, in fact. Okay. And then uh, to conclude, I think, on this uh, detection, uh, as I said previously, we, we had the first transiting super Earth. Also, we catch it. Uh, we catch it in the first year of um, of observation of the mission. Uh, you can see here the light curve uh, compared to the uh, Kepler planet. It is clear that uh, you don't see the transit by uh, by uh, by naked eyes if you don't know where to look at. In fact, the transits are well visible. But when you know where to look at, but at that scale, you cannot uh, spot them, in fact. So uh, at the time we, we um, detected uh, Transit 7b, uh, uh, the planetary, uh, the radius, um, um, the mass radius diagram was, was empty, in fact. We stand, uh, it, it stands here. Uh, just uh, lonely. In fact, uh, it didn't remain lonely uh, for long as uh, Coro, uh, Kepler announced uh, uh, Kepler 10b, which is a twin of uh, Coro 7b. So we derived the radius and uh, this uh, trigger also a lot of radial velocity uh, observation. And it, the activity for radial velocity was a real concern, in fact. And um, oh yes, I wanted to, to, to show the status of um, 
the mass uh, radius uh, diagram uh, six years later, and you can see. Uh, so here we we uh, we keep uh, the um, the author kept uh, only the planets with best precision on the mass uh, measurement, and you can see that Coro uh, Seven B is no longer um, lonely, but uh, there are some planets which are uh, in this uh, interesting domain of rocky planets. In fact. Uh, so for this, so I said, the, the radial velocity uh, campaign was very intense and very difficult because of the activity of the star. It triggered a lot of studies and uh, publication just to get the mass of the star. And in the end, uh, the, um, the consequences also of that is that it, allow, it allows us to better um, define what should be a radial velocity campaign in case of high stellar activity. And uh, in the end, we were able to, to get uh, a precise, uh, a rather precise mass of uh, Coro 7b. And so we, we know now it's a, a rocky planet uh, with a density which, which is compatible with a, a, an Earth-like uh, an Earth-like planet. In fact. Okay, so we had also the opportunity to reobserve it in in uh, and uh, when we catch it in uh, 2012. The star was less active, which was interesting. We, we could refine the radius uh, measurements. Uh, sorry, the reference is missing. And um, uh, okay. Uh, and now, and in addition, we know now that uh, there is a companion which is not transiting, but is which is detected in a radial velocity uh, in a radial velocity. Okay. Uh, to conclude, uh, I would say also that uh, Coro allows us to get the, the first insights into a giant uh, atmosphere through the uh, detection of phase light curves. We, we had also the, the, the uh, so you can see uh, the light, uh, the, um, the light changing uh, with, uh, as the, the planet orbit it's a hot stars, so you have here the transit, and then uh, you, you can see the phase of the planet and the eclipse when it's going, uh, when it's passing uh, behind its stars. So we had uh, a complete phase curve detected by Coro 1b, by Snellen et al, and confirmed by Alonso et al also, and uh, a secondary eclipse also of Coro 2b. Okay, uh, maybe uh, something. So, so you have you have seen that the issue we we were facing in in the, in terms of characterization is the fact that the magnitude of the the uh, the stars that were targeted by by the um, transit uh, missions, Coro or Kepler, uh, was uh, too high. And so we end up with very few cases of small planets for which we were able to get the mass and the radius um, with, a, with a good precision. So now the goal of the new generation of space mission is to move this histogram on the uh, hot star magnitude toward bright stars. The, 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 so the region where radial velocity surveys are, uh, are, uh, have their best performances. And that's the goal of the second generation of transit mission, KOPS and TESS, which are in operation today, and PLATO to be launched in 2026. And to conclude, I would say um, Coro has been a pioneer for space-based transiting planet detection. It has been, of course, outpassed by, by Kepler, which are provide us with a wealth of results, uh, but it doesn't matter. In Europe, I think it allows uh, the, the it trigger a new generation of, of scientists. Uh, we learned also to uh, how to work together, and that's uh, very important. It has been supported by an extensive uh, program of ground-based follow-up observations. 
which uh, allow us to get the ready masses and the complete set of orbital parameters, which are key also to, to uh, get some insights on, on, um, on the past and evolution of the planet. So it was well adapted to explore the, the closing planet population. Uh, we have in total, uh, including planets which are not transiting and that were uh, confirmed uh, by radial velocity, 39 planets. And uh, some which are still four, which are still not published, but in the uh, summary paper as uh, confirmed planets, but uh, need to be uh, published. That's weird. Okay, most are in the Saturn Jupiter like planets, and uh, but we had some uh, first, like uh, the first Super Earth uh, and, and some uh, um, uh, transiting brown dwarf, of course. Okay, so it was uh, the starting point to prepare also future and, and more ambitious exoplanet missions such as PLATO. And uh, I'm glad that we, we have a, a big PLATO community in Europe and definitely if people are interesting, I, I invite them to, to join the, the PLATO consortium. Thank you very much. And I, I can take uh, some questions. Well, thank you very much indeed, Magali. You have to multiply this clapping of hands by more than a factor 100. <laughs> Thanks for this nice uh, presentation and review of the Coro mission, which was a true game changer moving transit observations from ground to space. Now, those of you who are new, there are two channels to ask questions. One is you raise your hand in the, the participant list and then <clears throat> Saliba can give you the possibility to unmute yourself or you type in your question into the chat and then I can read them. So we already have one question in the chat by Ralph Lawrence. So he asks, was Coro selected in a competition? If so, against what other missions? And what was the mission cost? Presumably rather less than Kepler. Oh yes, definitely less than Kepler. I, I don't uh, I don't want to say 50 million if, uh, if I remember correctly. Um, yes, it was. Uh, it was. Uh, it went through a, um, a competitive process, uh, but it was French from the start up to twenty, uh, um, uh, up to uh, two thousand. Uh, it it was a French mission, and and so the competition uh, was done through our national agency CNES, and uh, the starting point was uh, asteroseismology. In fact, there, there, there was a mission which, which was launched, prepared and launched before Coro, which was called Evris, and which aimed at uh, detecting uh, oscillation from stars, but the, the, the launch failed and the mission was lost, the instrument was lost. So they prepared Coro. And then in 1995, when, um, when uh, um, oh, I'm, I'm losing my head, uh, 51 peg was announced, uh, some guys in France, uh, in France uh, realized that the, the design of Coro was well adapted to exoplanets. And so uh, they uh, proposed to have the, the exoplanet channel. And uh, uh, definitely it's, it, it was very attractive for CNES and uh, it made uh, the, the mission to be selected, in fact. So we were selected, uh, I think, a couple of years before Kepler. Uh, I think the selection should have taken place in 1999 or something like that. But then we had the uh, money issues and uh, funding is uh, the all the time uh, an issue. And uh, uh, so to rescue the, the, the mission, we asked for, for European um, contribution and, uh, and uh, that saved the mission. In fact, we opened to, to uh, European collaborators and they save, uh, they save the mission, yes. Thank you for this nice answer. There's a raised hand by Eike Günther. Saliba, can you give Eike the possibility to unmute himself, please? 
Hi. Yes, yes. I have. Um, so thank you very much for the nice talk. The fact that Kepler finds so few hot Jupiters, for me, it sounds like a selection bias. Now remind me, I think in Kuro, we, we looked at the galactic center and anti-center, and I think we have the same number of hot Jupiters in both fields. Yes, which for me would be an indication that why should Kepler then have less unless they have a strong bias? It's, it's possible. And I think what would be interesting is uh, would be to, um, to redo the, uh, these analyses with the same um, stellar population classification. Mm -hmm. It was very heterogeneous before, between Kepler and Corot. And I think there are still room to, to, to do this uh, kind of study taking by taking, for example, Gaia catalog and, and uh, redo the same kind of uh, spectral analysis in order to get a homogeneous overview of the uh, stellar population in the yeah. two uh, uh, fields, um, Koro is not a single mm -hmm. field, but the, uh, okay, in the Koro uh, regions and in the Kepler field, and then compare the results to check whether there is uh, indeed uh, a galactic effect or uh, a selection bias. Thanks. A comment on that, when you showed this histogram of the frequency of giants with uh, Kepler compared to Koro, it appeared to me that there were five measurements of Kepler. They were monotonically increasing with time. So maybe it's just a question of time when <laughs> you reach within the error bars the same value. Well, that, that's a just... good question. And you, you're right, because in, in 2018, uh, we, 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 we tend to be in agreement uh, in Two Sigma. Yes, you're right. Um, yeah, yeah. Well, this was just partly choking, but maybe. There's yeah, maybe. another question in the chat by Matthias Amla von Elf. Sorry, Matthias Amla von Eif. Thank mm -hmm. you, Magali. Very nice overview. I have a question on the legacy. You reported 39 planets and a summary paper. Which is the latest paper summarizing all planet detections so far? Is your 2018 paper the latest, the latest one? Yes, it's the la latest one. And uh, as I said, we, we report in this paper four planets, which are um, not, um, how would I say, published. They are published because they are in the, the summary paper, but we are still uh, waiting for the discovery paper. I mean, and uh, I mean, uh, uh, this paper, uh, the, the 2018 paper provide the, the, the parameters but there is no uh, in-deep analysis of the four planets' properties. So you're very welcome. Anyone is very welcome. I will be glad to, to see these four planets published. <laughs> so are there any more <clears throat> questions, comments? Thank you from Matthias. Raised hands. If not, let me announce again next week's talk, which is by Arvind Palmer from ESA at Nordwijk on XMM Newton, New Visions of the X-ray Universe. Benoit Mosse writes, merci to Magali. So let me give you a big hand yeah, for all the uh, participants. And this fits perfectly well to Magali's next talk at a different location, which is scheduled for six o'clock. Thanks very much, Magali, for this Thank nice video. Thank you very review. much for your invitation.